Welcome to Beyond the Breakwater, where just beyond the crashing waves of fear, discomfort, and doubt lies the greatest potential for life transformation. We want to guide you into the open waters where the calculated risk you take becomes the turning point for you or your organization to thrive. So drop your anchors and prepare for departure in this week's episode of Beyond the Breakwater. Welcome to a really special episode of Beyond the Breakwater. It is special for a few reasons. Um, One of them being it's our 50th episode. So that is a really huge milestone for us in celebration just because we've learned that not a lot of podcasts make it past 10 episodes. So this is exciting to be doing this for almost a year. And the second and most important reason why this is such a special episode today is that we have a special guest on. If you have been listening for the last couple of weeks, you've heard some rumblings of the special guest that's joining us today. But if this is your first time, welcome. Um, My name is Lindsay and with me is Ed. And our special guest today is Andre from South Africa. So welcome, Andre. Thank you very much. Yeah, It's It's a great privilege to be here. We're so excited that you're here. So Andre, tell the listeners a little bit about you. Like, what do you, what's your family like? What are your hobbies like? Um, who is Andre? Well, uh, Andre is a lawyer <laughs> in a small town in, uh, well, not so small town in Middleburg, Mpumalanga in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a wife, four children, three boys and a girl. Mm. Um, some are looking after themselves and some I still have to look after. <laughs> um, what I enjoy doing in my spare time is mountain biking. I enjoy going out and experiencing God's creation. Mm. But I've heard mountain biking for you is not just a small little feat. Like how many miles are you going? Well, it depends. It depends how much time I have. You if know, you had a whole day to yourself, how, how far I would, would you go? I would probably do... 180 miles. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would be stuck in this chair for the rest of the day if I biked that much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, it, it's one of my little quirks, but it's something that, in my view, um, describes me best mm. because it teaches you to, to who you are. Mm. It reminds mm. you of who you are mm. when you're traveling those sort of distances and I enjoy riding it alone. So it's my time with God. Mm. Mm. It's my time to think. It's my time to clear my mind. Mm. Mm. Um, plus, I think what a lot of people don't have anymore is determination. Mm. Mm. And uh, people are give up too easily. And when you know you've got to do 180 miles on a bicycle and you get tired, you've got to convince yourself that you've got to finish the job. Hmm. Especially if you're 90 miles away. Especially if you're 90 miles away. Especially if you're 90 (laughs) miles away. So, you know, I think cycling for me is just part of the description of life, Hmm. part of the experiences of life. Hmm. Uh, Many people give up very easily because they've never been taught by sport or something else to finish the job, to, mm-hmm. to keep going, even though it's tough. Mm. And all of us have tough times. Mm. Okay, and then my part-time job um, is is the Middleburg Care Village. It's a children's home, a child and youth care center where we, which we established about 20 years ago, uh, where we look after kids who've been placed there after having been taken away from an environment which is probably the worst of the worst. They've been abused. They've been neglected. They live in an environment where poverty is huge. We, unfortunately, in South Africa, um, unemployment is a big problem. What's the unemployment rate over there? Well, officially, the unemployment rate is 45%. Uh, On top of that, uh, if you look at a certain age group, the age group, that we are concerned with at the Middleburg Care Village, uh, immediately after leaving school, the 18 to 25 age group, it's closer to 55 to 60%. Wow. So That's really high. Ed, do you know what's the unemployment rate here in the U.S., just for comparison? I want to say it's 4%. (laughs) 
Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, so one of the uh, the the challenges that the entire community in South Africa faces is how to create employment and opportunity and a future mm-hmm. for children. Mm-hmm. And I'm not only talking for children like those that are in the care village, but for children. Mm. Yeah. Um, but care village children is, a, is an even bigger challenge because most of them um, would be placed there. They haven't been to school. They may be 10 years old. They can't read and write properly. Mm. How do you get them when they're 18 and we're supposed to say to them, go out into the big wide world and look after yourself. Right. But you haven't given them the tools. Mm. Right. Yeah. So I, I really want to learn a lot about Africa, like South Africa, the the scene, the environment, the government, all of the different dynamics there. Um, so kind of just jumping off of that description. Um, so all of the if you have a child who is 18, they don't have many skills. What is their typical um, like life trajectory? Like, where do you find them in the community if they cannot find a home at Care Village? Like, what is normal for that age group? Well, maybe <clears throat> maybe I must just go back a little bit. The South Africa changed in 1994 as a completely new political dispensation. Prior to 1994, South Africa was run by the whites, and everybody knows we were talking about apartheid and uh, separate development, and each each race group had to look after themselves. Since 1994, we've been a democracy, and and the democracy hasn't worked completely, mm-hmm. which is why unemployment has gone through the roof. Mm. But in terms of opportunity, there's huge opportunity for people who want to work. Mm-hmm. But there's a lost generation. People who, for whatever reason, never used the opportunities that came their way. And our education system is not as good as it should be. Hmm. So we have really good schools and some really bad schools. Hmm. We have schools where children are 25 in a class with proper teachers. And then we have schools where children are 60 or 65 in a class Hmm. with teachers who don't even want to teach. Hmm. And that balancing act results in a situation where kids that come out of school find it very difficult to find employment, especially the kids that come out of those schools with those big classes because mm-hmm. their, their abilities are limited. Yeah. Um, so when you ask what's the future for a child at the age of 18, those that were privileged enough to be in good schools have the opportunity to go to universities. Um, some of them will, will find professional careers mm-hmm. and Real can quick, look after themselves. The ones who are privileged to go to those schools, like do they tend to come from families that are able to support them in those schools? Quite Is right. that Okay, That that's still the same dynamic. It's there. still the okay. same dynamic. Okay. So where there's money, they get better schooling. Okay. Um, the reality is like in most, most countries, the 2080 principle applies. The twenty percent have the money that must fund the the eighty percent. Mm. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, sadly, there's eighty percent of those kids that find it incredibly difficult to obtain employment mm. um, and obtain additional skills of any nature to make them employable. Mm. And that's even more so <clears throat> in the case of children that that have that find their way into a place like the Middleburg Care Village, like mm-hmm. a, because they're there because they have no opportunity. So um, you mentioned a word. Um, was it apartheid? Apartheid. Yes. Can you explain that? Because um, I I am unaware of what that means. Well, you're definitely then a young lady <laughs> um, because the. It is something that caused South Africa to be ostracized in the international community. Mm -hmm. It was, let's call it legislated racism. Mm. Mm. 
where there was laws that protected white people um, and made certain rules which applied to people who were non-white, Indians, people uh, uh, who were black, black people. We call them coloured people in South Africa, but th that's mixed race. Mm -hmm. um, they had a different set of rules by law hmm. for 50 years in wow. South Africa. Um, that's a big change then. It, w it was a huge change. Mm -hmm. And what year did that change? 1994. Wow. So I feel like that is still very recent. Mm -hmm. It is extremely recent and we're still struggling to adapt mm -hmm. from, a, uh, from a political perspective. Yeah. So then the way things are structured now, you said it's more like a democracy. Well, right? it, it was always called a democracy. Okay. But it was a democracy for a specific group sure. of people. Mm. Now it's a democracy where everybody has the opportunity to vote. Everybody has the opportunity to participate. Um, because in the past, before 94, 20% of the people, make that 10% of the people, ruled the country. Mm. Mm. Now the majority rules. Mm -hmm. Where we are now we're finally finding out that, how did they say, there was retribution and rec everybody wanted to change and they wanted to be, be reimbursed for the damages which were given to them or done to them in the past. Mm. And they created, for one of the things that, that is a challenge in South Africa is that they've created this huge bureaucracy. Mm so that they could employ people even though they weren't necessarily qualified to do the jobs. Mm. So we find that when we work with, with, with government, um, they, their first priority is affirmative action. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that people who were previously disadvantaged are, are given more benefits. Mm. Sure. But that's cost the country a lot of money. Mm. So maybe connect the dot for me. Um, in terms of Care Village and unemployment, you said before that whatever has happened has led to huge unemployment. And I know at Care Village, we're going to talk later in the podcast about how you're addressing that. But how did those policies impact such huge unemployment? Well, um, let, let, again, the place where we are now, people with skills mm -hmm. are emigrating out of the country. Oh. Right. So they, they've left a vacuum in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a particular area, especially in the area of technical skills, artisans, mm. people who can, who, who can fix cars, people who are electricians, people who work on the mines in, with technical ability. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a gap in skills and there's a gap in education, which right. means there's a huge gap in unemployment, or just a large unemployment. Well, there's large unemployment. Mm -hmm. And because the education is low, we don't, we're not upskilling enough people to fill those gaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's also causing why a lot of kids come to Care Village? You said there's 108 kids. Do you think that has to do with why things are so bad in these households? Because of education, skills, morals, I, I would imagine, are part of this? Morals are. There's a, it's, it's a consequence. Mm. Because there are a lot of people who um, are unemployed. They want the government to look after them. They abuse substances, whether it be alcohol, whether it be drugs, mm. whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. and they stop looking after their kids. Mm. Mm. And then those kids eventually end up in a place like the care village. Mm. And, you know, we, we only look after 108. In 2004, when I started, I, I asked the social workers, can you give me a list of people who may need a facility like this? They gave me a list of 500 kids and said, oh, mm. wow. That's that's just in our area. Wow. Mm. Wow. So something that exists in America, and we've talked about this on like other podcasts as it relates to other countries, um, but in America it's like we have a government welfare program that takes care of those who are in poverty. Um, and so we've 
kind of talked about providing goods and services and making the unaffordable affordable for those who are just outside of poverty to have a means of providing for their families. Um, in some countries where there is not a, a government welfare system set up, um, we tend to see um, communities of people taking care of one another. So could you cover what is the the scene of that government program in South Africa? Like I've heard that you you have the government taking care of kids. So is that a safety net that exists currently? Yeah, well, it's it's all it's all relative. Um, on paper, we have welfare programs. We have uh, we have a government that puts money aside for purposes of looking after kids, looking after old people, um, and looking after those single 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 parents and things like that. Mm-hmm. But it's not enough. There's not enough money mm. in the government coffers mm. to to really look after them. And I'm, uh, let me give you the example. Yeah, we get a subsidy from the government for children. That subsidy, in real terms, in dollar value, is two hundred dollars per month per child. What we need to look after a child. In just to just to give him the basics, yeah. food, education, transport to school, schooling, is probably about six to eight hundred dollars per month. Wow. So where uh, are you coming up with that that difference between the government giving you two hundred, but say you need six hundred? Like where are you making up that four hundred? Well, sometimes I think it's just by miracles. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's. But it's good-hearted people, kind mm-hmm. people, people who would deliver food to the care village, people who who provide us with funds, people who see an opportunity mm-hmm. to help. But it's not sustainable mm. um, because people can do that once and maybe twice, but then their savings right. run out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um the corporations are being bled dry by charitable in- institutions who say, please help us. And they try and help everybody. The consequence is they're not helping everybody enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious, what happens to a child if they, you said there's 500, this is, goes back 20 years. Yes. But you can take 100. Yes. What happens to the kids that? They, do they, they I, don't get to us. They don't get to you. They end up in the streets. They end up in the streets. Mm. So that sounds to me like that would be an impossible situation to be prepared for life. It, it is impossible for them. Mm. You know, for me, the care village, and maybe for me, the care village is, is, is our starfish story. I'm sure you sure. know the mm-hmm. starfish mm-hmm. story. A little boy stands on the beach. The tide is going out. All those starfish are lying on the on the on the on the beach, and they're going to die because the sun is going to burn them. And this little boy starts throwing the starfish back into the sea. And uh, a guy walks up to him and says, "But what are you doing?" And he says, "Throwing the starfish into the sea." And he says, "But why?" Look at all these thousands of starfish. You can't make a difference. And the little boy bends down, picks up another starfish and says, made a difference to that one. Mm. Mm. So the kids in the care village for me are those starfish. Mm. And we don't always make a difference to all of those. But if we make a difference to one, then it's worthwhile. Mm. Mm. That's incredible. that's That's where I come from. Yeah. It's an incredible ministry that you're doing to kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank you for what you're doing because you work hard behind the scenes Mm -hmm. to do everything you can to make sure that there's enough money to provide so that these kids have a chance in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I must say, Ed, you've taken me on a tour of what you guys are doing with Beyond the Breakwater. And uh, my mind is spinning about (laughs) how to... uh, to, (laughs) how to apply that mm. to the care village because I can honestly say I'm tired of asking people to mm. just give money. Mm. And what you're showing me 
is an opportunity to say to them, invest in the care village. We look after your money and your money will continue making a difference in the lives of these kids. Mm. And with your money that we can turn around because we're not now asking for handouts, we can create a future for those kids. Mm. Because our vision is that at the end of your, your tenure at the care village, we want you to be able to go and look after yourself, be able to, to find a job, be able to have a family, be able to look after yourself. So quick question for you. Um, we would call that an orphanage when like parents have died, but you've, you've shared with me that when parents are removed for horrific situations, removed from their families, and then these kids are um, at Care Village, that's where they're placed, yes. and parental rights are terminated. They are terminated. So when they come to you, their their parental rights are all terminated. So would you call Care Village an orphanage? No. Okay. No. How would you describe it? Well, it's it's a it's a it's a care center for damaged and traumatized children. Mm. I don't ever want to say because I we have been appointed as the legal guardians and parents for these children that they don't have biological parents. Mm. They still have biological mm -hmm. parents. They may have mistreated them, they may have abused them, but it's still their parents. Mm. And in the end, for me, I would like to have, give this kid a future so that he can have a choice to rebuild that relationship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that he's strong enough to cope with, with whatever life has thrown at him, mm -hmm. including parents who abused him. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that's really hard for kids if they leave Care Village and maybe go back home. I can't imagine what that would be like for them. Well, I I can tell you it's 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 traumatizing every time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Some of these these children are told to go and visit their parents while they stay with us. Oh. Is that um, something that like you guys encourage them to do or something that's mandated by those who remove access? It's something that's mandated by the okay. social workers who, who remove access because okay. they would like to reintegrate families. Mm -hmm. And that's the policy in South Africa. Unfortunately, and we don't necessarily agree with it. In some instances we do because the, the parents want the children to mm. to be back and mm -hmm. and uh, and they want the, their children back at the end of the mm -hmm. of the day, but what happens now is some of those kids come back traumatized even more right. mm. because they weren't fed, they were abused, mm. they were exposed to the worst possible possible behaviors. Mm. So I I I in some instances I want them to go back, in some we don't want them to go back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do the kids live um, like 100% of the time at Care Village, like they sleep there, or are there kids that go back and sleep at their... No, we're a full, full residential okay. care center. Okay. I'm also curious, what is the scene of the church like over there? Are, are there churches that are present? Are there any support systems from the church to Care Village? Yes. we We've got one church in particular, which is supporting us extensively. Mm. Um, they come in, uh, they do Bible study with the children, they spend time with the mm. children. Uh, we, we are a Christian-based organization, mm -hmm. so we, we spend that sort of time with them. Our manager, Quibus Kukumur, is a, is a pastor, mm. so he, he tries to share as much as he can with the children. Mm -hmm. So the church... At times has been less involved and then it's it, it has been more involved. And right okay. now we're in a very special place because mm. we've had, I want to say, it feels to me in the last six months that God is just creating new life mm. Mm. in the care village and, and we're starting to see it in the behavior of children. 
Um, we're seeing it in the behavior of people who support us, mm-hmm. not only the church, but everybody who comes there comes there because they feel God has put it on their on their mm-hmm. hearts to do that. That's incredible. Seems like a big responsibility, not just to care for these kids, but spiritually care for these kids. It's a huge responsibility. Yeah. Because it, you can't say to these kids you have a future mm-hmm. if, if they don't have a spiritual base. Mm. Mm. Because part of what we say is there's salvation. Mm-hmm. But if we don't share that with them, then do they get that benefit? Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I don't think that we, we can say, and, I, and I, me in particular, that I can say, all this has happened because of what I've done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's happened because of God's wanted it to, mm-hmm. to happen. I've had so many miracles in building up to getting the care village going and in the 20 years of the care village, I've experienced God's work so often. Mm-hmm. He's also told us when we were going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on Sunday morning, do the kids, are they... Able to go to church? Yes. Okay. Yes, we, we send them to church mm. on a, vol- a voluntary basis, but lately um, the, the, the numbers are, are growing and growing. Mm. At the stage it was only 20 children. Mm-hmm. Now there's, I think, about 45 children that go to church. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned one church that was pretty heavily involved with Care Village. Um, speaking for the general church in South Africa, like you, we all talked this morning about the Beyond the Breakwater model, there being the harbor and then the breakwater and open seas. And a lot of churches here in the U.S. tend to stay in that harbor where the church here is kind of a church for the church or taking care of themselves. And part of the purpose of our podcast is to encourage churches and leaders to start serving and interacting with the community where they are currently existing so talk about that in South Africa. Like is is the general church outside of this one that is involved in Care Village, do they have a tendency to serve those locally? Kind of talk about that. that no, dynamic. I think uh, yes. The, okay. the, the general community of churches uh, find themselves in a safe place mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they won't easily move out of their comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the church in South Africa, which which used to be an incredibly strong foundation in the community, um, has has lost some of its foundation. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the majority of them are just they just look after their own. Mm-hmm. And I think your explanation or the beyond the breakwater concept, mm-hmm. they all in the harbour. Mm. The one that we're talking to is starting to move. Well, not only starting, they've been over the last number of years have moved out of the harbor Mm. Um, and they go and see the difficult things and Mm -hmm. they go and take on the challenges that life throws into the communities. It sounds like there's a lot more opportunity for churches in South Africa to go beyond the breakwater because the needs are so great. Yes. And yet, in spite of all those needs, they tend to be huddling, as we call it, in the harbor. They are huddling in the harbor. Wow. I mean, uh, there's a, there's a uh, you were, Ed, you were in, in Middleburg and you were in the township. I can tell you that the vast majority of churches have never even been in that township. Wow. Mm. Wow. And that's where the needs are. Hmm. Hmm. So um, I'm going to have a real moment here and ask you to pass this to Andre. <laughs> I, I didn't drink out of that. I poured it in this cup so it's safe. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but um, so you mentioned the, the needs of the community. Um, they, they've never been to that area and they're in like a, a drivable, questionably walkable distance, but easily to get there. Like talk about the needs of your community. Like what are you assessing are the strongest needs there? Well... I think firstly, they need opportunity, they need to be prayed for. Mm. There's a lot of unemployment, so there are people who need food, there are people who need jobs. Mm. Um, And if you drove through that particular township, 
Houses are looking terrible. Mm. They build. They live in shacks. They have no electricity. So okay. little things mm-hmm. could make a difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For for us at the moment, the focus is in sh- in ensuring that our children get those opportunities. Because then at least we can create a body of adults mm-hmm. that can look after themselves. Mm-hmm. So you have an incredible opportunity at Kerr Village. I mean, you're on how many acres? Yeah, we're on about 13 acres. So 13 acres um, with lots of homes and lots of places for the kids. Um, you have a chance almost like within the township or within your city to really make an impact on these kids and their futures. Where if a church would just go into the community, it sounds like it could be overwhelming, but you have a very select group of kids that that others could are invited to come in and be a part of it, so that at least these hundred eight kids' lives could be really changed. Yes, mm-hmm. you know, for, for us, again, I go back to the starfish. Mm-hmm. We we don't necessarily select those kids, but when they're there we have the opportunity to make a real difference in their lives. I met a lot of those kids when we were there and you showed me around and we got to meet them. Amazing kids. Mm. And uh, I know my heart was really moved by just seeing it all Mm. and meeting some of those kids of just... And I think, I know we're going to talk about this in the next podcast, that there's a lot of opportunity, uh, even for us here in America, of how can we maybe partner together with Care Village yeah. um, to make a significant impact um, in their lives, in their future's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll talk more about that again in the next podcast. Yeah, I think, uh, and just kind of wrapping up this episode, though, I, I do want to give you the, the floor to share that too, because if this is for some reason the only episode that someone might be listening to, I don't want them to have to wait for the next one or, or follow through on the next one. So how can a listener... Um, find out more about Care Village. I know personally, like we're going to link a video that you guys put together in the description um, on YouTube. And then if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Music, that will be in the description as well. Um, So I would encourage listeners to check that out. But we always like to give listeners uh, something they can do before they go. So how can people find Care Village? Well, the Middlebrook Care Village has a Facebook page. And if you search it, you'll find it. The, there is also a, a website uh, on, the, on the same name mm-hmm. um, and you, anybody can contact me by email either by c- getting hold of Ed or my, my email is pretty easy, andre at mcvcare.org. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to talk to me. Mm-hmm. And if you want to make a difference, uh, we're looking at a couple of ideas one of them is we, we, we're going to try and establish an endowment fund here in the U.S., mm. uh, which is in the process of, of being finalized uh, in order to, to, to help us to, to fund our shortfall. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the ways in which we're talking and Ed and I have been talking about it is, is perhaps to get involved in a food program where we will create a, a bank account or establish a bank account where money which goes towards food for a particular child or for the, for the, for the children is deposited and we give the undertaking that every cent of that money mm. as we receive it will go towards food for the children. So there's an opportunity which I think is relatively easy and with the exchange rate between the South African RAND and uh, and the, and the dollar, it's relatively cheap. Mm. You know, I think if if I could share that, mm-hmm. please, um, yeah. we can feed a child properly for between two dollars fifty and three dollars a month uh, oh. a, 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 a day. Okay, a, a day. Sorry. Mm. So that that gets you to about ninety dollars a month, mm-hmm. uh, and then we're giving them proper food and mm. good food and healthy food, prepared. Mm by dietitians. So let me just clarify something for the listeners. I heard you say if somebody chose to um, be a sponsor for a child, they could give a gift of $90 a month. And did you 
really just say that if they give ninety dollars, then ninety dollars goes right to food. It will go straight to food. No money is taken out for administrative costs. So it's a one, what we call a one-to-one -one ratio, of you give a dollar and a dollar goes for food. That's how we would do it. That's amazing. That's not very normal for uh, nonprofit organizations to do, but um, I think it's a great way that you're setting it up to do that. Yeah. Well, I must tell you the reason why we we would do that is because that would save our entire cost uh, food bill out of the subsidy monies hmm. if we could have that and it makes makes our lives a lot easier hmm. so Lindsay maybe talk through for a listener who says they really want to be a part of that um, how do they get a hold of us because hmm. we're we're helping to set this up yes. Yes. and I think we have a process to be able to set it up so anybody um, anywhere who says I want to be a part of this we could really help them with that how would they yeah. do that I mean, for now, I would mm -hmm. say listeners can reach us at um, our email, which is hello at beyondthebreakwater.org. Um, I think we'll eventually have some website stuff set up to navigate people to and interact with Care Village in that way and give to to the purpose of feeding kids. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, yeah, you can email us at hello at beyondthebreakwater.org. Um, Andre said his email earlier. I think we'll link that in the description as well, just so people have that in writing. Um but yeah, this has been a really fun episode. Um, I think the listeners really felt like it was a special episode. So Andre, thank you. Ed, thank you. And we will be back um, next week with a follow-up to this conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Beyond the Breakwater, a podcast of Elevate Community Ministries. Don't let the conversation stop here. You can email us at hello at beyondthebreakwater.org. We would love to chat with you, answer questions, plan a visit, and help you take your next step. We'll see you next week.